So for those, I think most of you aren't new to the, the series, but um, I've said this before, the, the series is run by West Sussex County Council, been running since September, and you know they've been put on in order to give businesses um, the option to utilize digital tools and gain expert knowledge from all our facilitators um, with advice on how best to grow your online presence. So with the hope of attracting and um, gaining on um, new customers. So Freedom Works and Creative Bloom have run sessions previously, and um, we've moved on. Um, this is a fourth series run by us at Always Possible, looking at growth expansion and new products. So um, we've been talking about anything from cybersecurity, online sales, keeping productive, um, automation, digital tools. Um, we're covering it all in this series. And we're halfway through. So more sessions um, coming up next next week and the following week but um yeah we're, we're halfway through the series so nearly at the end um those that are not aware of the digital champions this is the opportunity um, for you as attendees to access your eight free hours of support so business support so the digital champions experts in lots of different areas um but yeah they're going to be joining some of the sessions um and offer this so Feel free to just look on the slides here and see the expertise that they offer, um, specialisms in, in consultancy, marketing technology, and all aspects of digital adoption. So um, they'll be popping up on each of the sessions. So feel free to reach out and ask them any questions. There's the rest of them. Lisa's been joining quite a few sessions as well and, and really helpful with that. So they're all listed here. And again, I'm just gonna list on the access for, um, sorry, the the way you can access the free support. So um, as I said, they've got lots of different specialisms. Um, you've all got individual needs, um, so they can point you in the direction of the, of the particular champion that can help you with your business support. So um, we'll put the link in there as well on how to um, access the support, but any questions, feel free to throw their way. Um, so we're continuing all our sessions uh, through series four throughout the remainder of January. And I've listed them all here, Emma's um, included today. So um, we'll put a link here on, on the chat on how to join. So um, you've already met Emma, she's popped up. So um, today's session, um, we're joined by Emma, Emma Mill Sheffield, um, who is a consultant and business coach. And we'll be delving into the world of remote working, tips to support your business from onboarding and keeping your teams productive. So over to you, Emma. Brilliant, thank you very much. I will share my screen now. Okay, so you should all be able to see my intro. I'll give you a bit of background to me, why I'm here, what I do and how I work. But what I really want to know is all about you as well. So it's uh, it's sort of, it's one way as in you're muted, but I really want to hear from all of you in the chat function as to uh, what you do, um, what your business does, you know, where you are and what your challenges are. So there'll be lots of interactions throughout. And if you do actually want to come off mute, what we'll do is if you can just pop it in the chat and say you want to, to contribute and we can, we can do that as we go. So thank you, Steph, for the intro and welcome everyone today to this session on boosting productivity. I do a lot of work in the productivity space. Um, I spent 15 years in corporates in industry so I used to run major global projects <clears throat> and obviously they're deadline driven they're stressful you've got very um, you know diverse needs very typically distributed teams as well across across the globe so remote working has obviously shifted in the last couple of years to something that we go oh yeah that's really normal but yet it used to always be part of business yet actually you know, we never quite got it right. So a lot of the work I do with, with businesses now, as I'm in a consultant, um, have been for the last three years, is working with them on how to increase efficiency, productivity and resilience through their own, um, with, with their workforce. But predominantly, for me, it's about people. So we can put in a nice project plan. That's easy. That's fine. And we can look at business growth. We can look at your you know, strategy, your goals, um, you know, what needs to improve to help get you there. But ultimately, it's down to the people in your business. 
So I do a lot of workshops and training on how to um, to lead well, how to look after yourself as a business owner, but also how as a, a leader and a leadership team, how you can um, work more effectively together and create you know, really thriving and inclusive workplaces, in-person, remote, hybrid as well. So I've, um, because I do a lot of work in sort of the productivity space, I like to work much smarter. I think that's, that's you know, the, one of the buzzwords, isn't it? But for me, it's about life is just short. So we just need to get on with what we have to do. Um, because of that uh, and, and my interest in the background I have, I'm also chair of the board for suicide prevention charity, I sit on the board for the Brighton Chamber. Um, I'm an associate with the, the brilliant Always Possible, uh, also a growth champion, with Coast to Capital and student mentor. So what I do is a little bit of everything. Um, you know, I'm not it was sort of a, I guess, leaving the corporate world meant I can actually do what I really want to do and have more impact. And that was one of the decisions that made the, the drivers for me to 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 leave that and a four hour day day commute, which is, um, you know, not great. So for me, I look at businesses and people in business much more holistically. It's not just that hard drive of efficiency or productivity and doing more with less. It's very much that stop, take stock, think about what it is you want to do. How do you want to work better? How can you work with more purpose? How can you do something for your community? Um, or how can you even just, you know, go to that four day week and a working week and, you know, eat ice cream on the beach all day on a Friday, because why not? And so I bring a lot of that sort of ethos into the work that I do. And today's session really is about productivity from a people sense and how you communicate remotely and how you really include people. So you've obviously had other sessions on productivity from a sort of a tools and tech perspective and, and tips on how to work productively. And then I'm taking that into the, the sort of the, the, the bigger, broader, the, the team sense. So how you can work with others and encourage others. At the beginning of lockdown, I did quite a big piece of work with a, a large sales organization. Um, and they, you know, they have real struggles and challenges, how to keep people motivated and be resilient when actually you're a very extroverted sales focused person and the world's on its head and you're now having to do everything online and that was a real eye-opener to see how different types and different people reacted so I'm going to share some of that with you today and talk about um, you know what makes us tick how we can work better and how we can support our teams and our staff better as well and this isn't just if you have a big business and this is about a whole team, this is also, as a freelancer, how you might work with others and how you might be um, included as a remote team and what te tech you might need to be involved with and um, you know how you become part of that um, sort of um, satellite team for, for a company. <clears throat> so in the chat, I'd love to know from everybody What's your business? You know, tell me a little bit about it. And what are your challenges? So around that sort of boosting of team productivity and what you'd like to get out of this session today. And so I'll leave you a minute to just type away um, and I will start to read them out. Okay, so not enough hours in the day from Lindsay. Yep, um, I think there's been some I'm not a big TV fan, but I think there was be, there's been something on about everyone having the same 24 hours and there being a, a bit of an issue around it because it's quite divisive. Yes, I mean, you know, it, it can feel like that, but equally it's, you know, there's a lot of, of, of how we prioritise. And I think, I don't know about you, but sometimes you can start really well <clears throat> and you're really in a sort of a, a productive mindset and a bit of a groove and you're prioritizing well then the next thing you just go okay well what's happened to my diary you know why is this a mess um and we're not winning anymore which i think is a a common feeling especially for small business owners so anyone else want to contribute or steph i might ask you actually um if that's okay what your your thoughts are uh-huh all coming in i'll come back Sorry, to you around do you want me to speak up or on the chat 
Oh yeah, no, please. If you just yeah, just just speak up if that's okay. <clears throat> just around the sort of the, the challenges around productivity and and maybe if there's anything you thought, oh, I'd quite like to get out of this session. Um, yeah, definitely. I think um, you know, you know, I've spoken to you in um, in length about this, but um, I only joined what was possible last year, so joining September um, in September from the corporate world into. You know, it's a, it's a business, but we work with a lot of um, social enterprises, um, charities, organisations. So quite a different way of working, but much more. Um, gosh, so always possible is so advanced with the way that they work in the systems, the digital realm. You know, Monday things like that. And it was, I think, it was quite refreshing for them to hear that they had much better systems in place than a big corporate company. Mm. you know, who have a lot more finances, resource, that sort of thing. So, um, yeah, it's, but obviously, you know, everyone's working remotely. So um, I'm really interested to to hear about, you know, as a small team, how we can kind of support each other and, and be productive and how much time do we think about sp um, meeting up in person as well. I think that's a key yeah. thing. Um, yeah, areas yeah. like that, I think. Cool. Thank you. And I think there's an agility for smaller businesses. Some were left behind at the beginning because <clears throat> they hadn't got the tech. They weren't cloud based yet. So they really struggled. I do know some businesses and it's a bit mind boggling now to think of it, but all of their systems were, were paper based. And so they were still physically taking paper to someone in accounts to rubber stamp it, sign it, scan it, send it to somebody else. Mm -hmm. and so when lockdown came, they're just like, well, what do we do? And you'd think, crikey, we're still, you know, I didn't think we were still working like that, but there were pockets of businesses that were still on premises and not cloud-based. So they really struggled. I and think you're right. I think it's the, the agility part, you know, some big yeah. businesses really do. They've got so many red tape to go through and so many, you know, you know, people well, to it. get things signed off. It's difficult. That's it. And I do know one of the, um, you know, colleagues ex-colleagues in one of the, the big four they were saying that the teams was just starting to come in mm -hmm. and they were just kind of testing the water last you know let's say january february with quite a long lead in time yeah. and by march they're like right get on with it yeah <clears throat> and so for them it's actually and a lot of others it's really accelerated um digital transformation which has been great but what i do know is you can only be in one place at one time and although as a small business owner 2020 might not have been, you know, particularly pleasant for other people. They were still on Teams calls from seven to seven, at least, and they're exhausted and they can't get any work done because there's this constant vying for your time. Mm -hmm. So we'll talk a bit about that because there's something very, um, we have to be very conscious of how we pull back out of video as well. So I've got some, um, some comments here as well. So... Yes, so Isla, biggest challenge is keeping everyone working together remotely rather than working in silos. Yeah, absolutely. It, it's a funny one that because it'd be interesting to know more about your business, but that's where you, you, you have to kind of unpick what's needed. Is it project driven? Is it deadline driven? Is it just, um, you know, sit there and just get on with your own work? So how do you have those um, much more collaborative sessions? Uh, I use um, Miro or Miro a lot for that which is really quite good. And um, I work with different organizations using that in different sessions because it means you can chip in. I'll be honest, it's just not exactly the same as being in a room with people. Uh, but I also think you shouldn't have people in a room if they're just gonna sit there on their emails because you might as well do that somewhere else. So we have to change our mindset about how we work. Uh, so Gillian, yes, you're in sailboat project, um, sailing school in Chichester Harbour, uh, office in Brighton. Brilliant. So welcome. Struggle between time and meetings and time working on my own, uh, managing a short working day time wise. There is also, I'd say, a lot of power in not attending meetings and asking in advance. It's, you know, it, it depends on the culture of the organization. And I'm conscious that with CICs and charities as well, it can be much more collaborative. So decision making is shared um, rather than it being necessarily as, as, you know, focused as some businesses. And that's part of the, the culture, the ethos, and, and it, it's, it's lovely. 
but it can feel difficult when you know you're sitting in a meeting going I shouldn't be here I've actually got stuff to do <clears throat> so knowing in advance being quite strict on what the agenda is um, what am I going to contribute or is there something I desperately need and can it be an email after do I need to be there is it a decision making is it collaborative is it just a broadcast from somebody to tell you what's what's been happening recently and kind of working out what type of meeting it is and whether you can even be really strict on saying you know what actually um i'm not going to add the most value to this rather than saying it's not best use of my time it's yeah, you know my value wouldn't be be added on this one so i'll uh, you know attend a different one working from home with emma so working from home distractions yes general life and family that is a real balance her balancing act and i think it's got better because you know hopefully we're not homeschooling at the same time as trying to do everything but it is definitely about kind of batching up what it is you do so not just the tasks but the type of tasks and thinking right this is a dedicated two hours i know i've got on my business and then i know the kids are around so okay it's going to be a bit hit and miss and then there's time when okay i need to be with the kids because it's it's you know dinner bath and bed or homework and then not being distracted with work at the same time. So it's almost like mentally color coding what you do to be able to split it up. And Vicky's got um, a to-do list focusing, yep, yeah, straight away for the start of the day, especially even better doing it the day before you get distracted and then you kind of go in with the most strategic um, starting point. Uh, and yes, I think we probably have all come out of bigger businesses or corporate world um, to go out on our own. So yes, keep waving the flag. Keep momentum on larger projects whilst dealing with new demands and daily firefighting. Yes, that is something I hear often. And there's definitely a issue around prioritization and urgency when things come in. And knowing that the bigger project is slower moving, but it's chunky and it's what's needed versus stopping and going, oh, look, Teams, Slack, email, ping, 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 must respond. Um, and so, yeah, having those dedicated times to then look at those that kind of ad hoc back and forth so yeah we have moved five years ahead i think um with the pandemic and technology so there are benefits to it um and yeah brilliant all right so let's look at tools that you currently use and i'm leaving it really open um in terms of working with others so this isn't just you know, email, but what tools do you actually use? Anything other than email. So it could be in your business and it could be um, you tapping in as a freelancer into somebody else's system. So Miro, Monday, Slack, same. Google Drive. Oh, I hate Google Drive. I don't know why. Does my head in. Um, maybe because I'm a Mac user, but I'm, I don't know. It, it it's something that just, um, you know, I have to, but it's not my go-to. Teams and GitHub, yeah, okay, that would make sense in um, in software and in, in development and everything. Social medias for jewellery, yes. Okay, so different platforms for different reasons and different audiences, I guess. Um, different ages and demographic and location. Asana and Drive, okay, yep, Trello uh use of bigger tasks yep struggle to get out of diary notes for day tasks okay so it's really easy i think to get well into what we can deal with now so we end up going into the detail and especially the quick wins when actually we need to keep stopping and checking ourselves and looking at all right no, get back a step what's the big thing i need to be doing what's that What's the chunk of that project that's going to move me forward? Not the whole thing, but what's that tangible piece that I can do kind of, you know, now uh, to, to be able to sort of have an impact on the bigger, the bigger picture item. A few of them are great fun making multicolors here. So Slack, we are probably fairly used to. Um, especially even as a, you know, as a freelancer, you don't need to have, the, have a big business. It's going to be around um, different groups and different people setting you up on a different channel. 
it's great. In fact, Steph phoned me on it the other day because my mobile just was not going to play ball. Uh, she said, oh, I'll just phone you on Slack. I'm like, oh, 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 hello, okay. And it was, it threw me completely because equally you've got WhatsApp and you can phone and that's on the laptop and, and everything. In fact, I forgot to stick WhatsApp on here, but I wanted to highlight that. I don't feel that's necessarily a team tool, a team management tool. And I do know businesses that cross that line into, yeah, we've got a social WhatsApp group, but I really don't agree with having kind of business WhatsApp groups. It's not, it's quite personal. And so it can be quite invasive when it comes to a, um, uh, a time aspect so suddenly you know 10 p.m you've got people pinging you and it might be over the weekend and you feel like it's getting at you rather than it being a, a you know just a social thing you might want to have the alerts come in um slack so yes monday monday uh dot com not monday the day because i always get really confused when we have meetings on tuesday talking about monday it's great for lots of project management um, and kind of task tracking and progress tracking. I don't use it so much for Gantt charts and full timelines or anything like that. Um, but I'm pleased to say the days of Microsoft Project are, are over. Uh, I'll try and avoid that at all costs now. It is great for also um, alerting people to different um, tasks and updates. I think you'll notice the colouring is and, and the, the branding is very similar to Slack. They do talk to each other very well. So you do find that you get a Slack alert that Monday's popped up and it's also sent you an email. <laughs> so it's fine if you're on it, but if you're out and suddenly you get 30 pings, you think, well, okay, well, what's, what's going on? So it's up to you. And I would say it's up to you and your teams to agree on how you want to be alerted to try and dull down the distractions and the notifications and just have the important um things come through trello is nice and user friendly again that can be run on a project a person a department basis however you want to do it um that's so that's quite good and all, they all integrate which is the lovely thing um oh isla you're still in ms project hell oh, i'm sorry about that <laughs> I, <don't, laughs> I think if it's absolutely needed it's needed asana is is quite good but I think projects is still the um, you know the king of of what you possibly need. Microsoft Teams, I don't like it. I'm not a fan. And I have three Teams accounts because I use them on different client accounts. But it feels less. It feels like it's driven more for a single organisation. So if you are in a business that has a lot of people, Teams is great. But if you're trying to dip in and out, you literally have to log in and out every time to a different instance, rather than, um, say, Slack, where you can just hop across channels and it doesn't give you a problem. So I find Teams quite buggy. Um, so that's not my not my go to. But for people who do have Teams, then obviously it's it's absolutely everything in one place. Uh, and that makes sense. And Miro, uh, it, I love it. Um, it takes a little bit of getting used to, but it's very much online collaboration, whiteboarding. You can have very quick outputs as well. If you get the knack of running workshops and sessions on it, you can have an output quite quickly without having to sit there and go, right, I'm going back to all the notes and, and sending something out. You know, two days later, you can just send something out in a couple of hours. Um, people can collaborate online at the same time. Also, uh, separately you can send a password protected link I think it freaks some people out if they're not used to it so don't be surprised if you do use it if people don't then come back in afterwards but it is it is useful uh, and Lumio that's great as well so um, Vicky great question are they payable or can you start up on free versions apart from teams because I think it's part of the bigger suite and I'm not sure what the um, subscription is on that the others generally slack you can absolutely use very well without having to pay um i don't I haven't noticed that i mean they sort of harass you to pay but it, it doesn't affect functionality trello yes um you can do a lot for free miro you can go in 
for free, but it depends on what your usage is going to be as to and your collaboration requirements as to how much you pay. But again, they're sort of only at less than 15 pounds a month, but it depends on what you're using it for as to why you need it. But if I was to run a Miro session and I sent you a link, you know, there's no, you don't need to pay. You literally just, um, you know, just um, hop in. And Monday as well, I think there's a free, but there's normally a base level of everything. Uh, so that's, you know, you shouldn't have to, shouldn't have to pay an awful lot at all. But that's part of what I tend to talk to people about as well is use what's appropriate for your needs and the output that you expect. We are brilliant at being magpies with technology, especially when they put a flashy advert in front of us and go, hey, this is really easy to use and brightly colored and fun. And we go, oh, I need that. I need that. In reality, there's probably a lot of apps and programs sitting on phones and laptops that aren't used. So I'd always think about well, what's really needed. Using Cisco and their WebEx function and their whole kind of Microsoft Teams equivalent is great in a big business, not necessarily relevant for a small business. So always use your tech appropriately and accordingly. And if you've got four staff, you know, you can sit in that baseline entry package, I think quite well. And yeah, so I think that's fine because otherwise subscriptions do creep up when we add in Zoom and we add in Canva and we add in Calendly or Acuity and all of those um, great things. So that's just a little view of collaboration. Uh, yes, they do go with mobile phone apps as well. In fact, all of them do. Um, oh, I say that. I haven't used Miro on my phone yet, but it would be a bit fiddly. So, um, but all the others, yes. Something to just step back a moment and think about when we talk about productivity is, this is a, a study done by McKinsey at the beginning of lockdown. And I don't think it's changed, which is why I still use it and refer to it, is that we need to understand what the remote working landscape is for people. Not everyone has the same setup. Um, not everybody has peace and quiet and a home office and a comfortable, you know, ergonomically laid out space or anything. Some people are still craving the face-to-face -face learning. They might be new graduates. They might still be sitting at the end of their bed. Um, you have a house share, everyone's at home. You know, there are loads of different things going on for people or also digital issues with connectivity. There's so many. So I think it's important to still remember that although we've kind of got our heads around working remotely, it was still very different. And we have different time zones, even if you've absolutely nailed it, you're still working across um, continents. So think about being flexible. What are the challenges people have between work and personal lives, particularly working parents and caregivers? There's, I've seen a few times, um, some sort of things that have cropped up a bit of is it not dissatisfaction from you know teams saying that we're all about flexible working it's all very very easy flexible great absolutely promoted um and, and that's all that's all seems great in writing but we have a nine o'clock call every single day and so it goes against the flexibility when you think about school runs or shift work or anything like that so just be conscious of how you, you structure that time. And also being remote, have the opportunities to pause and reflect, have healthy habits and have a sort of sense of community and shared purpose. I'm gonna come back to that later, uh, right at the end. But we do need to make sure if diaries are maxed out that you know, we, we stop and take stock of that. I was talking to a, an employee who was quite fraught and she was really cross that her diary was basically full from eight till six and she had a slot at 12 o'clock for an hour and that was her only slot. She wanted to get lunch and somebody put a meeting in there because it was free and she felt the onus was on them to be respectful of her time and I said well actually the onus is on you to block out chunks of your day because you're the only one that can control your diary. Because if someone sees a, a, a free spot, that's it, they're in. So do make sure you and people in your team have those, that kind of rhythm to the day and those habits. Even if lunch is blocked out for two hours, you go, fine, I just don't do calls and meetings in that time. I take a break, take a walk, 
Um, but actually I get my own stuff done as well. So I'm working, but I'm, you know, it's my time. So just be quite um, strict with your calendars. Productivity and motivation uh, can be driven when you kind of change team structures as well, have different projects going on, different uh, ways of working. And that can also boost motivation, especially that intrinsic motivation. Um, delegating authority means that people suddenly feel more empowered to do something and therefore they're more motivated and they start to kind of work differently. Communicate really well, so that's two-way communication, even more important when you're not face-to-face, uh, -face, and also clear expectations. So sometimes we can work faster when we're with somebody else and we're kind of bouncing ideas around. But if you're sitting there, and this is the silo issue sometimes, with your head down for days, don't really know what, what's the end game. So what, what are we trying to aim at, aim for? What are the expectations? And if somebody says, I've got a four-hour day, because that's what I'm doing between because you know, like, they work, you know, 10 till two and that's that's routine. They're not going to be able to do 30 hours work in a week. So just be conscious of those expectations and the needs. And in the supportive environment you need to create is to have empathy and flexibility for people is prioritize mental health and also creating psychological safety, which is absolutely paramount. Um, was more critical, you know, 18 months ago but even now you need to have those environments where people the culture is driven to the extent that that people will call out bad behaviors and you're not having those teams channels and those chats which is just gossip or it's toxic um that people actually say well hang on a minute that's that's not okay because otherwise if people are remote predominantly or 100 percent, you can feel very got at uh, and we can also lose nuances of communication as well, especially when typing. So that's just a, the remote working landscape, I would say, something to just think about when, and also for you, um, if you, even if you work on your own, just think, oh yeah, well actually I'm, I am dealing with loads of different suppliers and freelancers or clients, and what's their, you know, what's their view of flexibility? You know, do they love it if I email them or send them a message on Teams at seven o'clock on a Friday night? Um, because, you know, that works for me, but, you know, why not work for them? So delegation. This is something that is, uh, I love talking about delegation to people, but I'd like to know what your thoughts are. So could you just add into the chat what your experiences are of delegation? Okay. As you're typing, I'll just move on to the next slide. <clears throat> okay, yes, Isla. Um, as long as the delegated person is trusted to get on with it rather than micromanage to death, you almost read my next slide. Um, yeah, you're absolutely right. Some people think they can't delegate because I haven't got time to show you what to do. So it's easier for me to do it 20 times over than to show you once how to do it. But that's often a, a, a fear of... Um, relinquishing control, that it might not be good enough, um, but actually we can, we can work around that. Difficult for Gillian, a number of paid team on short number of hours, yeah, and volunteers are obviously unpaid apart from expenses. So for that, it has to just be so super clear, very, very straightforward. And, you know, these, these are the tasks, basically. It's quite repeatable. That means you don't spend ages showing somebody how to do it and then the next time having to show a new person again and again and again and yeah as long as you're precise and you, people know exactly what they need to do and the expectations should work well so sometimes what we think it is uh, and you hear this in larger organizations especially very hierarchical ones that it's oh it's, it's all downwards and literally you just kind of get rid of it uh delegate the heck out of everything and ultimately it lands at the bottom somewhere probably doesn't get done how you want it to and you don't take any ownership often tasks you don't want to do or too much work not enough time lack of resource or capability um, which is why we get rid of things and also it's just not my problem so um, you know it comes in so Stephanie gives me something and I look at it and go oh no it's not for me and I give it to Annie Marie and she's thinking well oh thanks for that great now what do I do with it you know, so she's immediately going to think, well, hang on, 
am I going to do okay with this? Will I fail? Will I not? Because I don't know why. And so I've kind of brushed it off and that's not okay. It still always goes back to the person who starts the process and they need to know what they're asking for. Do we have enough resources, enough time, that sort of thing. So yes, you need to, if you show trust, because if you agree outcomes, clear tasks or activities, agree enough resources. So, you know, I ask Annie Marie and she says, well, actually, I think this is a two person job for three days. You go, oh, okay, well, we need to find someone else as well. It's not fair to ask one person to squeeze it in. So with that, are the timescales achievable? Does somebody need full supervision or just support? So is it a case of, actually they know exactly what they should do, but they're just gonna to need to check in occasionally, or you're going to need to check in and say, how's, you know, how's it going? Versus full supervision, which is right, we're going to sort of do it together first. Like you'll watch me, we'll do it together, then I'll watch you doing it. So just understanding where people are with their experience. If they're competent and willing, bonus. I mean, I know it sounds silly, but they need to be able to do it. But are they willing? So if they're not willing, it's not going to, you're not going to have necessarily the best uh, experience. Give constructive feedback. There's no point taking something back with an eye roll and saying, oh, I'll do it myself next time. It's a case of taking that time, first time especially, to give proper feedback. And then that should be learned. Find out who's best suited for it and also if they have a choice. So if you've got a couple of people who could pick something up and they have a choice over it, then the person who wants to do it is more likely to succeed. They're more likely to prioritise it. They're more likely to be able to commit to it and put more time and effort in and ultimately a better outcome for everyone. So that definitely is a productivity piece because when you're working remotely, you need to be clearer on who does what and how. So it is very much those kind of bite-sized tasks at times. So part of sort of boosting a, a productive team is about having good internal communication and cohesion. So a good manager, good business owner um, will be planning, communicating, decision-making, delegating, problem solving, and motivating all of the above. And it, in my mind, it should just make a good all round decent human being but they all actually take skills and not everybody has all of them but by breaking down those chunks of it you can work out what it is you need to do and realize that here we've got communicating as its own section and also motivating so when we think about co cohesion in a team well how do we look at um, motivating a team or maybe we're going, we've got a, a new project delivery, right? So under problem solving, we're, we're, we're going to work out who's going to do the right thing when, who needs the support, and how is it going to go? And how are we all going to agree to communicate around it and sort of make that, um, to make that real? Not everyone's going to be brilliant at everything all the time, but it's good to just think about those key elements of, I guess, that internal communication. Because if you're in a big office, you're as detached as if you're working remotely. If you're in a small office, you overhear things all the time. So you know what's happening and you can sense the mood. But if you're remote and you get an email that's quite stern, that is, you know, quarterly results, update, full stop, or, um, you know, quick catch up dot your performance. I mean, that will send fear into most people. It's not necessarily the intent from the sender, but you need to remember how your messaging is going to land, especially when it's written. So think about how you uh, work with your teams and how you want to communicate. And also it's the same with clients. You know, if you're going to have to tell them there's a delay on the project you're working on, probably gonna to need to pick up the phone and then probably follow it up. You can't avoid it, and you know, if you just send an email, it doesn't always it doesn't always land that well. Yes, no caps, no shouting. I I do have someone that does that a lot, <laughs> and it is actually really reflective of their character. 
uh, which is not ideal, but you do get suddenly get these highlighted words uh, in caps and you think, God, you really are quite, you're kind of doing angry typing as they're going. But that does bleed into the culture and the staff and, you know, it's not, not ideal. So key staff interactions. Um, this also it does apply to working on your own and freelancing. Some of the key staff interactions, I would say we're onboarding. Well, actually, let's go back a step. We're interviewing, so interviewing remotely. That's a, that's a different skill set completely. And onboarding, uh, inductions, one-to-ones, both formal and informal catch-ups. Appraisals fall into that. Um, socials, that's another weird one. So remote working through the screen, remote socials through the screen. And when you leave, you sort of put the lid of the laptop down, the laptop gets collected. And then on Monday, you get delivered a new laptop, lift up the screen and go, oh, new team's cool, new team, but I'm still sitting in the same place. So it's a really weird um, shift that sometimes doesn't happen when you leave jobs and you change jobs between sort of where you were and where you are because you're still sitting on the same seat and that's quite odd um, lots of people don't think about that when you're bringing new staff in managing performance issues can be really challenging remotely and that's where i'd always urge you to get hr advice on that but how do you have these conversations and whilst you're putting things in the chat steph can i canvas your views because we had a good good chat about this didn't we but about onboarding um mm. always possible because obviously you're fairly new in um mm. and your experience because i think that was that was for me that was a really good example of what works well or how it can work well yeah it was um gosh i'm trying to remember what i said to you <laughs> it's um yeah it was a really positive experience i think um the way they did it was is was quite new to me. I was um, asked to record a short video, um, almost like a, a little interview with myself around what I could bring to um, to the team, which threw me a bit at the start. You know, people are used to writing a cover letter, doing a CV, so putting the onus on me, but also so much of it is about character fit, and I think people forget about that. Um, you know, it's it's obvious when people go into interviews, but interviews are invariably done over Zoom now. So having that interaction and being able to see someone can definitely, um, I felt it, it separated, um, you know, if I was going to be up for the job or if I was suitable candidate. So that was interesting. That was the first phase. And then I had um, an interview with um, two of the team. One of them was not going to be directly working with me or they're doing some projects. And then um, I had an informal chat. So the process was just really positive. It was, there was lots of phases, but it wasn't really, really stressful. Um, you know, the approach was good. They acknowledged on the call that Zoom was not an ideal way to do it, but in COVID world, um, that's how things had to be done. So it's about, you know, having that awareness and making people feel comfortable from the offset that, you know, it, it's, it, it's not how people want to do it, but make it as relaxed as possible. And, yeah, so I think that was the process. It was it was quite a new one to me, but um, the actual onboarding part of when I joined, I had lots of chats with um, you know remotely again with with the team. Um, it was you know individual chats. It wasn't work related. It was just you know they said find out um, you know common interests, have just a chat. So it was very laid back, very relaxed. It wasn't pressured. I got to know people before we started working together, really, which was it was a really key thing for me but also um you know we, we have regular team meetings where we actually meet up in person every couple of months so it's nice to see the team then but you know we have we also have team meetings weekly on a tuesday morning and it's again it's not so work focused it's more just checking in and really really focusing on people's well-being and seeing how they're feeling whether it's work personal you know just having that open forum you know we're fortunate we are a small team there's only 12 of us now but um it definitely eased me into feeling part of the team and feeling valued and that people really wanted to hear how you were and people were checking in on your mental health because there's no getting away. Working remotely is is challenging. So, yeah, sorry, I've gone into too much detail, but um, that was great. yeah, no, it's <laughs> that great. was 
I, I know I said to you, Emma, when we spoke previously, it it wasn't it couldn't have been a more positive experience, and I think that's the way they did it. And and for them, it was quite a new a new thing. You know, they've the way they've recruited previously was different, so they really thought a lot about it. But um, it it felt well thought out and well planned for taking into account that it was just going to be conversations over Zoom, and that was that was the yeah. only way really. And I think that's great because you've got different interactions with different people. And I think two years ago, for most people, if you said, oh, can we have a video call? You'd think, oh, oh, well, I suppose. Where do I sit? What do I do? Um, you know, and if someone invites you to a Skype, you think, oh, yeah, <laughs> God, yeah. you're still using that. But it's, you know, there's a good sort of, there was a, a need. I mean, I've used Zoom for a few years, but not everybody does or did. And so you almost had to have a good reason to, to do it. And it was uncomfortable for a lot. And if you're asked to do a video interview um, or sorry, a, a video piece to camera a couple of years ago would have sent shivers yeah. to most people. Whereas now you think, okay, I still don't like it, but I'll do it. Whereas when you have the chat, it's so much more human. And we also do hop on a call, but very quickly. So it's not weird. It's very mm -hmm. much, yeah, let's just quickly see you face to face. So I think our confidence has grown because you've had to adapt to it. And yeah, I mean, I've even, you can do remote, uh, remote desktoping. I've done that on Zoom in lockdown yeah. to fix my mother's IT issues. That was great. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, there's definitely ways and means and it's, it's just how we adapt, but it's not the same as face to face. But if you can make it as close as and as human, and even having people working, you're working anyway on your own stuff, but you've just got it open in the corner so you can ask and say, Well, you know, I'm new. So, Steph, well, where's this? Where's that? Where's the other? Like you would in an office. Mm -hmm. I think that's underestimated the power of that because if you aren't online and it's a formal meeting or you sorry to bother you because everybody's busy or yet it's another slack or teams notification i'm not going to phone you and think all right am i going to be bothering her she's probably on a call and you know how do i find the the hr policy for instance so you want to be able to have those very quick chats with people and i think that's where we can use technology better and remember how it works well because otherwise if you do start a new job and you're just left in the lurch to say well mm. here's a link to the server here's all the stuff we do get on with it that's when you get a lot of um, disconnect yeah but I think having those kind of informal chats with people just finding out about them you know you could people would argue that it's a bit frivolous and it's not a good use of time but it's so important for people who start I've massively valued that because I felt, you know, it built a relationship, it built um, a rapport. And then, you know, and the same with our weekly meetings, they're, they're not particularly work focused, but they're really about just connecting people. And, you know, the team of um, Rich, Richard, our CEO said it himself, it, it does feel frivolous, but it but it's not, it's massively valuable to everybody. Mm. And we all look forward to it. So, and it's fun and it's, yeah, it keeps it light and it, yeah. Yeah. And if you flip that into the workplace, physical, sense you'd still go for lunch with people you'd still mm -hmm. have coffees you'd still stand at the water cooler mm -hmm. I remember look, looking around offices in the past thinking are people actually doing any work because there's kind of 30 to 40 percent of the working day is productive if you're not um if you're not careful mm -hmm. so even if you are focusing on okay we have an hour together that's still probably less time but because it's structured it feels frivolous but it's still probably less time than if you're in the office and just all having that kind of you know chit chat round so I think it's good that it's there that space yeah great so communication skills just a quick overview here uh, around just being careful because we're remote we have to work a bit harder with communication skills and so clarity of message is is key checking understanding um, especially if there are different cultures involved and different responses to questions, it's worth just working out, okay, what's happening? What's the summary of that? Is it agreed upon? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. Off we go. Uh, taking turns, it being a fair conversation, especially if someone's very um, maybe shy, they may be more introverted. So always be conscious of who's taking up the space 
in a in a room listen actively so that's a completely different uh, piece of piece of work um, to, to sort of do all the training around empathetic listening and active listening and, and good communication skills but make sure you listen to understand let people talk um, and choose the right method of message it could be a whatsapp could be a teams could be a phone call uh, or it might be because you're not that far actually let's have a coffee so just know what you want to say and how it's going to land be self-aware uh, so your own body language and how you come across and if you're if you're really stressed or wound up just be aware that that you know might be really seen by somebody and if they're on their own at home and you've got to deliver a difficult message you might just want to have that called uh, at a different time an appropriate body language not so bad on uh, zoom on calls but don't be distracted don't be that person sitting there like that typing away uh, on a call knowing that they're not they're not listening so make sure you're present and with body language I think there is you know an element of arm flailing and uh, sitting there like that you know maybe disengaged but that's probably the person that would do that in an office so once you know people it's easier but just remember that your first impressions come across really quickly in that little little square like that communication types and I was thinking I was going to have a break but because we're just cracking through content I think we'll just keep going and we can always finish a little bit early so if that's all right again looking at communication style and types of people this is a whole um uh, you know modules of things elsewhere but be conscious of how you come across and how others come across uh whether you're, this is sort of a manipulation or submission going on aggression and passive aggression um whereas being assertive is the the more conscious response the others are more emotional they can be quite um all of them can be manipulative actually but being assertive can come across as being blunt it doesn't necessarily mean it is, but be conscious of how you do come across online, especially with your teams. And also if, if someone's being very submissive, are they also quiet and maybe introverted and they're being submissive? They're really not contributing how they should. So it's worth that call just one to one. Say, OK, you know, maybe a meeting didn't go that well online because there were a lot of um, conflicting views or lots of loud voices. So it might be worth having the chat to say, look, okay, well, you know, what's, how do you want to handle these in the future? Um, and just to include everybody, whereas your aggressive person will be there, you know, straight out there in front of the meeting. They also probably need a phone call about how they come across to others because they might be grandstanding and you know taking up all the space so that's just something to think about um because we take a very quick view online when we're on video calls we suddenly go oh that wasn't nice or that didn't land you can't have the natural conversation where you cross over you chip in two of you are talking another two and another three are all kind of mingling and talking around the room you have to be very much right your turn my turn your turn my turn again so if you've got any issues with with these styles you find that it's it's it can be harder to deal with online um, and your manipulative person gossiping might be the one who's in the the chat function on the side um talking down about people in that meeting and so things like that are very very destructive so ultimately we want people to be assertive, speak their mind, but very balanced and respect the rights of others. Top tips. So moving on to kind of keeping team productivity high. I like to reduce distractions. So in meetings, yes, reduce distractions because no one wants to hear the you know click click of a the alert coming in. But also when you're working on your own and with your teams agree well when are we kind of going to unplug so let's not have those alerts always going your video calls you can reduce them and i always would always urge you to so keep them 
to, um, to the point, limit the people and limit time. And with that, working with your energy levels, so not against them. If you are very energetic in the mornings, then that's the time to not be distracted by emails, but the time to really work on that um, sort of topping green, that strategic task, that one thing that if you achieve will make a massive difference. So don't get hijacked by other people's issues. Um, it's about you taking time when you've got the energy to do the right thing. And also knowing that by the time you get to four o'clock, if you've just been working, and you haven't really been on calls, you can probably keep going. If you've been running sessions or on really difficult calls and meetings all day, the likelihood of you wanting to sit down and then be super productive and do something, you know, really strategic at four o'clock is really diminished. Um, so stay regularly connected. Everyone is different. So what do people want and how do they work best? Maybe they prefer a phone call once a week. Um, maybe they want something very structured online, or perhaps it's just a quick text message. So just understand that everyone works differently. Uh, the bottom one in purple, choose your apps or platforms according to the outcome you need, which I mentioned already. Be clear on what you're trying to achieve. So that works for you and for others. Divide and conquer the big tasks. So you don't have to do everything yourself. Um, understanding flexible working patterns which we covered as, uh, again. If you've got time zone differences as well, know when you are overlapping. So when is it asynchronous and you know when are we working in, 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 in sync? So having that difference and you know not expecting somebody the other side of the world to be answering what you should be doing right now. And also breaking down your time, if you can have time to really focus, time for admin and time for client calls or meetings or something like that. It's not just for you, it's about you and your team. So if you have this kind of general agreement, then it, it just means that you can all get more done and get it done you know, in, a, in a nicer way. But productivity often gets really pushed and gets a bit of a, a bad bit of bad press. But it's not about just starting to be productive. That's for me, that's way down the line, that's on the right. You need to know what your purpose is first and why you're doing what you're doing then you need to prioritize what you need to do and especially if you're delegating so if you begin with the end in mind and Isla would know that from a project planning perspective but literally where are we getting to right now let's work backwards be clear on the outcomes for you your team client you know what's needed and why we're doing what we're doing then we can prioritize reduce your distractions for everybody um Nice to have your contributions, Gillian. And um, yes, hope you enjoy other sessions when they come up in the next week or two. Uh, and getting the right resourcing. That's the other thing. So be pragmatic and sensible about what you can do uh, um, and who can help and you know what time is available. Then you can be productive. That's always the last kind of outcome. Just looking at motivation um, for a moment or two. So what motivates you? Do you think it's the same as what motivates others? And this is where I'd like to hear everyone's chat. Motivation, is it money? Is it, Isla, definitely not the same, correct? I would absolutely agree with that one. Uh, and I'll give you a few ideas over the next slide. But some people want money, creativity, problem solving, flexibility, Anne-Marie, yeah, that is a motivator for lots of people. Uh, flexibility in time, but also flexibility in maybe what you do or how you do it. So not being micromanaged and, you know, just drip fed things to do. Extrinsic and intrinsic motivation are very different. Extrinsic is very outcome driven and also it could be deadline driven. You may get external social gains, that could be money or power. Fear of punishment or avoiding consequences. If, so if you don't meet the deadline, um, where are we? Nearly the end of January. So filing and paying your tax return is uh, <laughs> that the fine is the extrinsic motivator. 
intrinsic motivation on tax return probably not a lot but maybe peace of mind that knowing that you did it months ago and you know it's not a, not an issue so you've got a fear of punishment there or consequences could be um, you know performance issues at work the benefits from the outcome of the process is is another part um it could be competition or fearing failure so your motivator is to get it done faster than anyone else because you know you, you don't want to fail but also you want to be seen to win so that's very extrinsic whereas the intrinsic motivation is going to be sort of inherently interesting work so something you actually want to pick up and get out of bed for in the morning it may satisfy psychological needs for autonomy and competence so that's a big a very important one purposeful meaningful and challenging work so something we can get our teeth stuck into and we actually believe we're doing the right thing and rather than having a benefit to the outcome of the process we actually enjoy the process itself so it's not just the fact that it gets finished and um you know you get a a completion fee because it's done early it's actually the process itself that is rewarding as, as you work through mastery is something that we often want to to learn and to sort of hone and curiosity and learning so being curious about what we want to do having that um, broader picture and knowing that you've almost got that permission to to play and it's it's safe to fail those are intrinsic motivators and that's generally what will get people out of bed in the morning as an employee if you're not ticking the boxes on the right i would say there's a lot on the left which is okay it's going to be salary it's going to be promotion uh, and maybe that's it stephanie i'm pleased you enjoyed the, you, you like the slide it's often i do work with lots of teams on this and understanding how to manage people differently and work with people differently so it's um it's something to just yeah reflect on and also for you to think oh, you know why am i struggling with something maybe i just i'm not enjoying i've got this massive report or something maybe i'm not enjoying the process itself that's probably it um but the you know there is a deadline so that's the motivator externally maybe mastery that's where it comes down to it's like okay you know what i'm nailing it this is exactly what i do and i'm the go-to person for you know massive gnarly reports in future and skip over that one because not super relevant right now so this um slide here about keeping productivity high this is actually more about managing and leading um, and coaching so if you are telling people what to do on the left typically this is time bound it's, it's time driven so it could be a deadline it could be delegating just giving you stuff but it's not great you are saying what you need them to do specifically and i don't mean that in the delegating well but literally right you just got to sign all these reports just got to do these things here's the plan this is how it goes this is what needs to happen it's not negotiable and this is what goes wrong if we fail it's basically telling somebody now there are instances when that's okay but if you've got the time uh, to invest in people and this is how we keep teams more motivated more productive is if you move to the right hand side where we're coaching it's much more reflective and you're helping people understand that now they know what the goals for the project are which is we're going to submit this massive report how do you see yourself doing it what do you need what support how can i help who else can you talk to and you've done it before so you know what the process is like what went well what didn't what could you learn and then ultimately they're defining what success looks like uh, to you rather than you saying this is exactly what has to happen and in the middle there's like a mentoring uh, it's like a continuum really a spectrum but it's okay so in my experience yes we've got this big report i recommend if you speak to x y z people about it you might get some information i'm not just going to give it to you but your journey and your learning is that you're going to find out and kind of tips on what the pitfalls might be uh things to consider and also in your experience well you know this maybe worked well this didn't um you know in your experience you know what the technology normally falls over on the last day so we should probably plan quite early 
and this is not tools based sort of digital uh, is going to be people driven so looking at team productivity nobody loves too much of what's on the left especially if it's told it is quite strict rather than it being um uh autonomous so you're really going to be told exactly what to do and that's all you're going to get if you're thinking a bit more about it and you've got that space to think and chat to others and collaborate more you're moving into the right hand side and actually it becomes a so it, it's a much happier uh, and productive team last couple of slides um I'd like to see if you have an answer for this, anyone. But what do you use for positive change? So what is positive change and where do tools come into this? Because we often use tools to just get the job done, but what is out there? What do you use? If you don't have an answer, put a cross, put a question mark, it's not a it's not a trick question, but it's not an easy one, actually. OK, so I'm going to show you. So Slack channel sharing good news. Yeah, that's good. And actually having one that's very specifically fun stuff. And I did, Stephanie, I did have to mute the word or one because I don't play it and I, I'm <laughs> I thought I can't do it. <laughs> Not I can't be pinged. Um, but I, you know, it's great when you've also got you know, jokes and fun stuff and whatever you've got in different channels. But I think it's quite an active channel, that one, isn't it? <laughs> I think it's divisive as well. <laughs> I think it is divisive. I even <laughs> muted the word wordle on Twitter because I just thought, oh, I can't be doing this. <laughs> I think it's one of those just um phenomenons that's going to fade away, but at the moment people are excited. <laughs> Well, you know, it's lasted longer than Clubhouse, so uh, this is, there's something to it. Okay, so we've got yeah, sharing positive things. That is that is a good it's a good place for that. I have seen with Slack with actually very different groups that cut across a lot of different um, businesses. Lots of collaboration. I mean, there'll obviously be people holding back, thinking, "Well, I'm not sure about sharing because it might be competitors." But loads of different, um, you know, who who knows somebody who knows X. So I had one channel I set up in there for a uh, sort of a, you know, who I'd love to meet, not quite a Lonely Hearts, but it was very much an intro space. So does anyone know someone that does or app development in this that in this field? And so it's just useful. It, it just connects people across different companies as well because we can be very focused and working in our own only but there's one thing i wanted to show you um just around positive change so this is quite cool actually no it's very cool i like it um i like the ethos behind it but um on hand is a great app so it's an it's for employee volunteering and it, there's a lot of micro volunteering in your own area it could be online but typically it could be dog walking dropping off shopping and it's a platform that connects people so it's 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 very low cost um, entry point and it's really good to help people do something different and having that sense of purpose if you remember you've got purpose and um prioritizing and then productivity and that intrinsic motivation knowing that you don't have to be stuck at your desk all the time but you can do something else for other people uh, is is fantastic so I was racking my brain, thinking about tools for positive change. And I thought, oh, this is just really obvious because it's something I'm working with at the moment um, with a couple of organizations. And it makes a lot of sense. So you can use the tools you've got differently to be positive, or you can you know, look at a different platform entirely to create that community spirit, because also you then have a internal community aspect to it as well, and sort of sort of like leaderboards, but it's nice to know that everyone has an impact and you're not you're not just doing your CSR hours from you know a central point, but you can do things differently. And that's it really from me, because I want to leave uh, room to have questions and chat and for Stephanie as well to tell you about what's coming up next. 
Um, but if you want to get in touch uh, to talk further about any of the topics I've covered, please do shout. Um, but that's that's it from me on the presentation side, Steph. I don't know if we if people want to come off mute or just chip into the chat. Any questions? Just go for it. Yeah, please do. This Emma's around for the next few minutes, so please do. But um, thank you very much for that. I personally really enjoyed that, and it was um, nice to hear other people's thoughts about how they're working and the challenges they face. Because it's still it's still a learning, isn't it? This remote working, it's still it's still a new one for a lot of people. And trying to, I was even talking to Annie Marie about it yesterday. It's like trying to balance how you separate your day and really being quite strict with it. Um, so it's interesting. Everybody's got a different approach, but um, yeah. Um, thank you, Emma. That was great. It's all right. I've noticed I try, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, um, try and separate out times in the day. Mm -hmm. But then I realise, you know, you, you look and go, God, it's back to back all day today, for instance, or yesterday. Work out when you're out, when you're online, because as well, we seem to forget now, it takes time to travel. And sometimes you rush back in and you literally screech down in front of the laptop and open it up and you're back online again. Um, but then knowing that probably tomorrow can't do quite as much first thing. And I still forget that, but I, I, I'm getting better at blocking out time, especially if, you know, I might, I might share, a, it might be something really early in the morning, work all day and then share a board meeting in the evening then you just go yeah, yeah yeah next morning i'll just crack on as normal but you kind of can't mm. can't get the um energy back to just lift open the laptop and go yay back online so just yeah. knowing how you work with that flow and it's okay to say that and you know be honest with yourself and and know and yeah i think you know we talked about it on tuesday as well it's about knowing when those when you are if you are a morning person um you know utilize that time and you know really do stuff but if you do have that three o'clock lull, accept it and mm. take it and go for a walk or whatever. It's, yeah, it's just understanding that. I think so. I think so. I was quite brutal before Christmas um, when a few Zoom socials started to crop up. Mm. I'm like, no. <laughs> just yeah, no. I, think, I think everybody's had a bad experience of one and it's just it just stays with you, doesn't it? <laughs> I think it goes back to it's what we had to do. Mm -hmm. Uh, not what we want to do and so when it cropped up again and some were local because I'd cancelled a couple of things before Christmas they're like oh well, let's just catch up online instead and I was like no you know I'd love to spend time with you guys but um let's just meet in January because yeah. <laughs> I, I can't force another another one and, and book clubs online because they couldn't be in person and I was you know my eyes were like that at the end of sort of 10 o'clock at night having been online for 14 hours and like no I'm not doing it again yeah. Um, so being quite strict about what you have to do and what you yeah I think I think it is it's it's it, you can be more selective and I don't think that's a bad thing at all you know mm. time's pressures and you said that right at the start you have to be really selfish about it I think because otherwise we can give too much and you do get zoomed out and you've got if people are in different locations I've got one group of friends we kind of really only catch up on zoom we meet once a year and three times a year we'll catch up on zoom and that's fine and I don't mind a lunch time, time chat with someone but if it's a forced right eight o'clock get back to the computer I tend to yeah duck out yeah I know Isla just said then that um they tried to set up a, a fun channel whether it was on mm. Slack or whatever and it died a death um yeah it, it happens <laughs> I think we're we're quite unique I think I'm, I'm sure not everyone's up for it but um most people get involved I don't know it's um if it if it if it's something you know that entertains everybody but it is quite challenging to do I've, I've definitely seen them not work in, in previous roles so yeah it's a tough one and especially if it's forced fun yeah that's the other thing you're like oh no you've now made it a thing so I get why they can just die uh, yeah. but it depends on what like you said what the theme is I mean there probably won't be a word or channel in three months we might, might not be one in three weeks no it'd be interesting to see all these channels that have just you know they've been there and then they've just disappeared yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I think all the pub quiz invites they they need to have gone a long time ago that was that was very may 2020 <laughs> we're all we're all guilty of you know novelty value when something new pops up you know people want to get on board yes. we're all guilty of that so yeah <laughs> they have a shelf life 
they have a shelf life and you know what they had a real need at the time yeah and that's fine but then when it starts to become a, a I think a bind when you think oh it's that mm -hmm. social that we have to be on mm. and I've on. spent all day at my computer yeah. yeah so yeah the thought of having a glass of wine on zoom again you're like oh no I thought those times are gone but there's a time and a place so if you're not online all day long that's great for lots of people if they have a very physical job or or they're out and about or you know they're not not on screen then it's great so yeah yeah so vicky no bingo now online <laughs> <laughs> yeah, again new yeah, novelty value yeah it's um yeah. it fades we learned how we had to connect people and you know there was a, a big camaraderie but also um a need and also a need to check in on people who are on their own Whereas yeah. now I think we've gone back to much more so back to normal, dare I say it. But when people were on their own or, you know, health reasons or how they lived, you suddenly think, ah, oh, actually, there's a different inclusion need rather than assuming everyone's got a family around and, and remembering we're not all the same as us. And no one's the same as us. So not everyone has, you know, what they need. So, yeah. Exactly. Great. Thank you, Emma. Well, yeah, again, I just want to say um, a final thank you for joining us today. And I, I certainly enjoyed today's session. I hope you did too. Um, we've still got lots more workshops running this month. So um, next Tuesday, um, Emma's kindly put them up on the slide there. We'll be joined by the wonderful Lucy Payne, uh, who we work with a lot. Some of you may have met her previously on our workshops. Um, she'll be exploring the tools out there for innovating in business. So anything from funding and tax benefits um, to deep data insights. So hopefully you join us for that. Um, we'll include the link here again for you to join those sessions. Um, then next Thursday, so week today, um, a slightly different session. Um, we're actually, it's going to be a panel. Um, so more of a Q&A session, but panel of guests from visitor economy businesses in West Sussex. Um, we'll still be looking at tech and digital tools, but looking at that disruption that they, that caused during the pandemic. So um, various businesses sharing their own experiences about how they navigated this, what tech they introduced and how they used it and where they are now. Some of them have, have you know, we've got Piglet's Pantry joining us, um, Sheffield Park, a national trust, um, also a, a company that works with lots of bars that, um, and pubs. So obviously they were hit massively in the pandemic and how the government rules changed all of that and how um, they supported those businesses. So um, yeah, um, hopefully you can join us for that. Um, we'll include the link again, so please do join us. But um, Enjoy the rest of your Thursday and hope to see you again next week. Thank you very much.